downtown Boston, Crockett's Victory Garden. Welcome to Crockett's Victory Garden. This is Jim Crockett. And as you see, the weather has changed and we're getting some uh, rain we have needed badly, which reminds me of a saying by Henry David Thoreau, who said, you know, there's no such a thing as a bad day. There's just different kinds of good days. And this is a great one for gardening. And I'm gonna start right in here by digging a leak. Now, you may have not grown leeks before. You've probably seen them in the vegetables counters and the produce counters in the store. The leek is a member of the onion family that does not form a fat bulb at the bottom, but rather this fat stem. Very, very delicious. It is edible at all stages of its growth. Now, it could be that if I were growing these commercially, I might like the whole field to mature to this size or larger, harvest them all at one time, and then plant something else. But the home gardener is in a different situation. Since the flavor is here, even on the tiny plants, you should start to harvest these as you need them. By the way, we planted these in a trench. That's why we have this nice, uh, clear, white uh, part of the, of the stem below here. A lot of compost in here to make this strong growth. Uh, you should try, when you, when you dig some of your new potatoes and then pull some fresh leeks like this, cook them together in a leek and potato soup and you'll have a real treat. Well, this is the leek. Now today, we're going to plant some perennial or biennial seedlings. We're gonna replant another planting of corn. So we'll be picking corn way up into the fall. I'm gonna plant some pansy seeds, which we will enjoy as blossoms next spring. And then in honor of this drought that we have been having up until this morning, I wanna show you some various gadgets for watering your garden. But first of all, I have a disaster on my hands and I wanna show you exactly what happened. I've always said that I'm going to call the shots just as they occur in this garden. If you look down at the end of the row of my lima beans, you'll see one bean down there, and then a fairly good sized one, and a small one, and a whole strip in here where no beans came up at all. I have in here a, a few rather straggly looking ones. This is the type of thing that comes out of the ground, no, no uh, strength in there somehow. Down here at the very end, I have one pretty good looking plant, which is not a very good percentage. I have been digging down in here in the soil and I'm trying to dis discover just what could cause this kind of a situation. Well, now look at this one. You see this bean is completely rotted. It never did have the strength to come out of the soil. Well, we know that the soil was well prepared it was prepared evenly throughout the entire bed. It had the fertilizer, it had the moisture. There is no evidence on these leaves of any disease or, or, or any insects. The, the whole thing is this, I'm sure. I didn't order these seeds with my other seeds this spring, but I got the seeds from a rack in a, in a hardware store. The seeds were cracked when I got them, and I think they were poor. I'm sure you've seen in seed catalogs uh, the sign, crop failure stamped on the cattle on uh, on certain plants or well, we had a crop failure it happens even to the professionals but don't be upset when it happens to you now we're coming to talk about the perennial bed you've seen this perennial bed i'm sure time and again this summer absolutely beautiful amount of flowers and the plants live for years and years well in this perennial bed we also have some plants known as biennials in a biennial is a plant which makes its vegetative growth one year and, so, and in the second year blossoms and sets its seeds and dies. And so just by the very math of it, you have to figure out that every year you must plant some seedlings which will grow that year, live through the winter, blossom the next year, but you're, there is no way out. You always have to plant new ones. Well, what I have here are some seeds, seedlings of a sweet william uh, called spring messenger. Now sweet william is a hardy biennial. The foliage will lie on the surface of the ground all winter long. I'll cover it over eventually with some pine needles. We'll get a great crop 
of flowers which range in color from white to many shades of pink and red into deep maroon. Next spring, about next May or June, they'll be in blossom. Well, here are the seedlings, and here is a piece of ground in which I'm going to plant them. And I have here to show you a device which Gary Motto, our gardener, made for me. A sort of a multiple uh, dibble, you might say, or a, 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 a way to make eight different holes at one time, all spaced in this instance eight inches apart because that's the final spacing of these seedlings. And as you'll see, you simply put a string along one side of the row, bring your, your board up to it, and put a little pressure on it, and you have the, the holes all made. Then you come up to this next set of holes and fit those in and come on from there. Now the nice thing I like about this too, being this width, is that it can ser serve as a uh, board to kneel upon when I want to lean over without squashing the soil here. So I can lean over in here, put one of those little seedlings right in like that. Now, the seedlings at this stage of the growth certainly look very, very small, but I'll tell you, they'll grow extremely fast. By this fall, they'll be They'll nearly be touching each other. They'll fill in the whole area around each one of these. So this is the this is the little biennial known as Sweet William. Now we have uh, several different kinds of seedlings set back here. When I move this back, you see, so there are uh, pegs in those holes. We end up ready to plant some more over in here. I use just an ordinary wood label for prying them out of the soil. Notice too that when I handle a seedling, I handle it by a leaf. I don't handle it by the stem. I don't want to squeeze that stem and, and, and take the life out of that little plant before it ever has a chance to grow. Hold on to the leaf, pull a little soil in around it like that. You see, that's all set to go. We'll give that a little drink of water and they'll be off and growing. Well, the next thing we want to talk about is some of the basics of soil preparation. And along with that, I'm going to plant some broccoli and also some lettuce. We haven't talked about soil preparation since last spring, but I have it right in through where I'm standing now, uh, an area of the garden where up till a few days ago we had beans. They uh, snap beans, they produce their crop, and now we're ready to put in something else, this case broccoli and lettuce. I'm going to go into soil preparation. If you want your garden to produce crop after crop, you had better put something back into the soil over and over again and enrich the soil. And I'm going to start here. First of all, I'm going to put some lime on this soil. This is just ordinary ground limestone because the members of the cabbage family, broccoli, cauliflower, things of that nature, like a sweet soil. So we put some lime on. I'm gonna sprinkle a little 10-10-10 fertilizer. Again, this is something uh, which will give those leafy vegetables a real boost and a lot of fast growth. Then, have here some of my compost right out of my compost pile. Just sprinkle that over. Now you notice that I'm not spreading it over the entire garden, but an area roughly two feet wide here. Get rid of some of those rocks. And then as far as, as uh, spading it over, the soil now has it's been uh, dug over this spring and all, and so it's relatively easy. If you, in spading, throw the, the soil ahead of you, and it's so much easier, you don't have to dig or lift such a big spadeful each time. You know, as I, I give it a crack with the, the back of the fork that breaks up the lumps. And eventually, you see, we'll rake through here, mark it off for a row. But Gary has already prepared some soil down here for me. And you see that I have a couple of lettuce seedlings set in here. Now, before we plant any broccoli and plant some more lettuce. Now, again, I use my 
planting board, let's see, that's six inches, one foot. The second foot will be up here. I want the broccoli to be two feet apart, and so the lettuce, which are the alternate plants, will also be at two foot intervals. Now I have in between here a little trench, roughly a half inch deep, and at the one foot mark, or between each of these lettuce plants, just drop in a pinch of four or five seeds of a lovely broccoli, which is uh, known as Cleopatra. Now this is a, a fine garden variety, rich green heads, and will grow very rapidly with the cool weather, which is coming up ahead of us. To cover them, pull a little soil, so they are covered about a half inch deep. In a week's time, they'll be out of the ground. In about 10 days or two weeks, I'll go along and pull out every plant except the strongest one in each place, and these will grow on to be the plants that we'll harvest in September and October. Now I want to go talk about flowers, because as far as I'm concerned, a vegetable garden shouldn't have just vegetables. And one I want to speak about today is the delphinium. Well, you can see down in here, this delphinium has nearly gone by, but this is what the flowers themselves look like. Beautiful, dark, purplish blue. Well, I let this particular stalk stay on the plant to show you the seed pods. Uh, the seed pods are formed here. These are green. But over in here, we begin to find some that are brown. And when they turn brown, they crack open at the top. And if you don't pick them, those seeds will fall down on the ground. What I want to do is to save those seeds, and we'll plant them in a few days, because fresh delphinium seeds directly from the plant germinate quicker, they, the plants grow along faster, they come up more evenly than if they'd gotten very dry. I'll show you what these seeds are. If we can pry one of these little things open. The little black seeds, I probably can't tell them much from, different from the, the dirt on my hands, but here they are, these little brownish black seeds, which will just pop on into this package. We'll plant those in a couple of days. Well now, you want to go from here to tomatoes. My tomato plants are getting to be giants, and I'm going to have to resort to one of the things that the commercial men do. They're just overflowing these cages, and uh, you know, all of the energy here seems to be going to green leaves rather than to, uh, tomato production on this particular plant. So what the commercial men do is to come right up to plants like that and cut off all of these tall stems. Now there's, there is, are so many tomatoes already growing down in there that we will have more tomatoes than we know what to do with. But we're going to shear the tops right off these tomato plants before we're through today. And we'll get those plants so that we'll find out that, that I'm the boss of these tomatoes and they're not just going to overwhelm me. Now let's go from here to another vegetable, and that's the asparagus. Now I have two very short rows of asparagus here. The first one I want you to look at is this great big clump of asparagus here. These plants were set in a year ago last spring as tiny one-year-old roots. They have made enough growth, so much growth, that uh, the ordinary home gardener uh, would be delighted if they became this big in three or four years. And the secret was compost. You keep hearing me say compost, but there is truly, there's nothing in your garden that will make plants grow as compost will do. Now from this bed, in, in uh, something about 15 or 16 months from planting, come over to this bed down here, which were planted this spring. And here you see I'm standing in a trench because these plants were set in the bottom of a trench so that the crown of the plants was eight inches beneath the ground. The, the idea is this, once these plants have grown and we've filled in the soil around them, 
Those roots will be buried so that they will not be damaged by cultivation. You can go right across the top of the plants in the spring before growth starts and cultivate the garden without hurting them. But what I'm going to do now is spread some 510-5 fertilizer in here. We're going to keep these plants growing, really growing rapidly. And this is one way to do it. 510-5. Then I'm going to start again to pull soil in around them. You notice that I'm covering up some of those leaves. Don't be alarmed. That won't hurt them. Those leaves will, will just rot away. Won't hurt the plant. Now we'll eventually, we'll probably one more hilling up or filling in like this. And we'll have this right up to the soil level, at which time we won't have to do this operation anymore, but those roots will be right down in the ground where they will live for your lifetime and my lifetime put together. I saw a uh, asparagus bed in England a couple of years ago that still bearing asparagus was 118 years old. Well, let's talk about corn. Just last week, we harvested from this section a variety called Butter V, very early, Good flavor, uh, not as good flavor as some of the late varieties. We just hauled those plants right out after they were, uh, we had picked the, the, uh, the ears of corn. Those corn stalks are now in the compost pile, getting ready to fertilize next year's corn. Well, the next variety is, be is getting to, uh, beginning to get ripe. This one is called Sprite. And again, you can see what we have here. This is a bicolor, a lovely ear of corn. This is the, the white and the golden yellow ear uh, kernels mixed together. A nice variety of corn, and it is the second early variety. Now, if you look behind me and across the row, you'll see that we have corn of all different ages, or, or different stages of growth. They're all the same age. They were planted at the same time. They will be harvested, however, over a period of six weeks or more. Well, now the day that we pull, oh, three weeks before we're, we finally pull those corn stalks out of the ground, you saw me come over here and plant some corn seedlings right here in the coal frame so that I would gain some growing time. I'm gonna have another whole picking of corn late this fall after most uh, gardens find that corn is no, lo no longer possible. These seedlings, what one kernel in a pot like this. We have, see this nice root system on here? Beautiful root system. Now I'm setting these into, uh, on one foot intervals, one foot apart in each direction. Notice what we've said about corn. We do want that corn to be in blocks so there will be four or five plants in each direction so that the, the pollen, which comes off the ears, off the tassels, will fall down onto the silk and fertilize the kernels. Nice looking little plants ready to go. But you know, when I talk about soil preparation again, I think of soil preparation, uh, something the way I do a savings bank. No, you can't keep drawing out of that bank if you don't put something in. Well, we went into here and added some horse manure and some 510-5 fertilizer, dug this all up. So this new variety, of, this new planting of corn is not going to have to, to uh, live on what was left over from the other crop. It has had the soil prepared for it too. You can't, you can't expect a garden to grow, grow if you don't prepare that soil. Well, that's what the corn situation is. We'll be harvesting this in September, late September, early October. Well, it's ironic that today, and wash some of this mud off my hands, today that we should be talking about ways to water your garden. But up until this morning, we haven't had any appreciable rainfall in this area for a long, long time. And so I must tell you the ways to water, and I have a half a dozen different things that you can use. The first that I want to point out to you is called 
uh, uh, soil water or sometimes a soil soaker. We we'll turn on a little valve here and you see what happens to this. The water oozes out when that, as that fills up. You see that the water begins to ooze out of the canvas in this instance and goes onto the ground without dripping. Very nice to put down. We have this running down our perennial bed because we don't want the water, the water to splash up on the foliage because that spreads disease. A good way to do. Another one, less expensive, is this one, which is made of plastic. This is a flat one with little holes in it. The, uh, the holes go in different directions, so we get a, a fairly even distribution of water. Now, frankly, in many a garden situation, especially if there's a mulch on the ground, I like to turn this right upside down, you see, so the water all goes down. The beauty about both of these is that there's almost no water loss to the atmosphere. All the water goes into the soil where it will do its most good. Well, now I have four kinds of, of uh, watering gadgets out here. The first one, just a little rotary type, relatively inexpensive and it does a reasonably good job. I have two or three things that, uh, things that I, I, which I wish it didn't do. One thing, it lays a lot of water down very quickly. Therefore, if you're using this kind of a sprinkler, turn it on for 10 or 15 minutes, then turn it off and allow that water to soak in, especially if you have a heavy soil, clay soil. Turn it on again. The idea is we want to get the water on the soil without making a puddle on the surface. So this is the rotary type. Then right next to it, I'm gonna say, Gary, would you turn on this one? This is a relatively inexpensive type of, of sprinkler. Comes up with a fine spray. Uh, again, as with the first one, this water is only in a circle. Well, I have seen very few circular gardens. Most of us have a rectangular garden. And so this next sprinkler, Gary, would you turn on this third one, please? Now this third sprinkler is an oscillating type, which can be uh, uh, adjusted to turn either to the right or to the left or both, or, or at, back and forth. What will happen uh, in any event is that the water is laid down in a rectangular pattern. And another nice thing about it is that the water uh, spray is constantly moving, so the water has a chance to soak in in one area before it is applied to the next. Now that is the, uh, the oscillating type. And then the fourth one that I have to here, and Gary, you might turn this one on, please. This is called an impact sprinkler, and this is the kind most like what the commercial men use. Uh, this machine is uh, adjustable to do almost any shape that you uh, wet almost any shape in the garden that you would like. For example, you can water your lawn or your garden right beside the driveway without getting the uh, driveway itself wet. Well, again, we get these questions on watering. How often should I water? You should water. For, let me answer that one first. If you don't get one inch of rainfall from the sky every week, then you should apply one inch of rainfall this way, one of these methods. And you can tell when you've put one inch of rainfall on the garden if you put a few coffee cans around. When you get an inch of water in your coffee cans, you have an inch of water in the ground, which, by the way, will soak way down into the soil. Now let's go into the greenhouse, and I want to talk to you about what you do with some of those house plants when you go on vacation. Now, of course, the best thing you can do is to have a friend who'll come in and water the plants, but that's not always the, the easiest thing to do. So let's take, for example, this plant, which is a small gardenia. I have a plastic bag here, which has no holes in the bottom, and that's very important. We give this plant a good drink of water, get the soil thoroughly moist, then I've just taken some little sticks, stuck those into the pot because when I pull this plastic up over it to make a little greenhouse for this plant, 
I don't want the plastic to be lying on the foliage or the flowers. So we can pull it up like that and take a little twist around here. And this plant is good for a couple of weeks, maybe even longer. The idea is that you don't want to put this in the sun. It wants to go in a place where there is bright light. Uh, what will happen is as the plant uses moisture from the soil, this moisture will come out into the atmosphere, condense on the inside of the plastic, run right on down here, and come back up through the bottom of the pot. But for goodness sakes, don't have a saucer in the bottom of the pot because that water has to get to those holes in the bottom so they come back up to the plant again. Well, let's talk about pansies. Next spring, when you're getting ready to buy pansy plants and they cost you 50 or 60 cents a piece, you're gonna say, gee, I wish I'd done what Jim Crockett said and planted some seeds along here in July. All of the pansies we have in our garden, we planted last July. And all I'm going to do here is to, you see I have a flat of, of potting soil. I use a little label like this to make some trenches about an, an inch and a half apart and a quarter of an inch deep. We will sow these seeds. These seeds look about the, the size and color of the seeds that you see on the, on the strawberry, the outside of a strawberry. Don't plant them too thickly. One of the big hazards of gardening is you have a whole package of seeds and then you plant them all together. They come up so thickly that the, well, in this case, the pansies would compete with the pansies just as though there were weeds competing with the pansies, which means that the plants themselves would grow up to be straggly. Cover those over very gently, about an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch deep, roughly three times the thickness of the seeds, the diameter of the seeds. Just pat those down like that. And do remember to label those. Now, uh, I had one here. The label for this variety is, uh, is Orange Sun. We'll put a label right in here. And this variety, we'll know is what is Orange Sun. And we'll plant more of it because there's no way of telling what this pansy's gonna look like uh, and by the foliage. You'll have to wait till next uh, spring's blossoms. Well, now, uh, we don't have time for questions this week, I'm sorry. Next week, we're gonna plant some cinerarias, which will blossom next spring. We're going to plant some asparagus ferns from seeds. And remember that this is the asparagus fern, wonderful house plant. And then outdoors in the garden, we're going to plant some endive, which we'll harvest late next fall. This is Jim Crockett in Crockett's Victory Garden. I hope you enjoy the program every week. <laughs>